Awesome. Ryan, my man, it's been a minute, huh? Yeah, it's been a while, but uh, happy to be back talking. I think, yeah, it would have been AFRAM 2019. Wow. Right? What a <laughs> yeah, good time. Yeah, so, but pandemic, things go by pretty quick. Yeah, it's, 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 it's been a ride. So, uh, but hey, I, I reached out to Ryan here last week. I wanted to catch up with him and kind of see where he's at, what space he's always navigating this. Do you like the word biohacking? How do you feel about the word biohacking? <laughs> you how, do you, I, how do you explain I, to people what you do? Yeah, you know, it's, it's difficult. I think that biohacking is probably the, the closest thing there is to it. But I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, I, I like the idea of sort of uh, functional preventative medicine, right? Preventative medicine, being able to, to address someone's needs and wants before they get sick. I love it, man. And, and getting, yeah, it's, it's tough because as a naturopathic doctor, that's kind of how we're engraved. And I always have to flip things around, right? And obviously, you're, you're with a new company now. You're, you still play with some peptides, but what are you up to now? Yeah, so uh, since my, my sort of uh, uh, experience in the peptide world, I've created a company called True Diagnostic, uh, which looks at, at sort of biological aging via uh, epigenetic methylation. And so uh, we started this company right around a year ago, actually in July of 2020. So it's still relatively new, but a, a really exciting field and, and one that I think will just explode here in the future, especially as we start talking about how to appropriately vet a lot of these interventions like the peptides. Yeah. And, and again, I kind of, we talked a little bit before the podcast as we were catching up and I'm like, oh, methylation. And, you know, I did a 23andMe, I think about 2000, 2013, I did the 23andMe and then I exported all of my data. I went to Genetic Genie and all these different websites. Is that what this is or what it, What are you guys doing? So, so this is, this is pretty remarkably different. So this is, uh, you know, those, those, tests like DNA, uh, you know, any DNA test like 23andMe is looking at sort of the underlying infrastructure of your DNA, right? The, the base pairs which make up the, the genes which encode everything that you do. Um, however, you know, every cell in our body has the exact same DNA, right? Our skin cells have the exact same DNA as our heart cells and our hair cells, right? All those have the same DNA, but their phenotypes, how they actually act and perform in our body are vastly different. Mm -hmm. um, the way that, that that happens is due to what genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. Every single cell is going to have a slightly different e expression of those same genes, and that's all controlled via epigenetics or sort of the changes above the genome, uh, how to silence and how to turn on genes in order to give that phenotype that's most ideal, right? So your skin cells can behave like skin cells and your heart cells can behave like heart cells. So what we're sort of measuring is not the baseline structure, what can happen, but what actually is happening due to some of these, these ways your body regulate what genes are turned on and off. Okay, so to bring you back a little bit, you were talking about we have different cells, right, all over the body. You have muscle cells, you have skin cells, and our and our and our genes kind of code for how they're made. Mm -hmm. But there there's things in the environment that affect that. Yeah, absolutely. Not not just not just the environment, but even hereditary. You know, uh, for instance, you know, bees, uh, you know, even when they're first born, they know exactly who the queen of the hive is, right? How are the, some of those, those experiences coded into our DNA? It's, same, it's the same way, right? Via epigenetic signatures. Um, you know, we can actually even tell if, if someone, if your great grandparents have, have been through some type of famine in, in your DNA, we can actually see Whoa. that. Um, and, and, you know, it's really, really sci-fi stuff because once we sort of use computer learning and really advanced mathematics in order to to really pair these things with correlations, we can come up with incredibly predictive algorithms. Probably the most popular, I should say most well-known of those algorithms is, is something by Dr. Horvath from UCLA called GrimAge, which actually can predict death uh, even very, very accurately. And so, um, you know, it, it's getting even more sci-fi where we can tell you how much you've smoked across your entire lifetime, how much are you drinking right now? You know, how many macronutrients have you had in the past week? There's some really interesting things we can do with this data. Um, and it's almost limitless because we can, it, it's so precise and, and cell specific and we can really train it to just about any outcome. So it's, it's really a, a new sci-fi level of diagnosis. Yeah, that's crazy because it used to be pretty, like you're saying, pretty backwards. I can measure my genes. You're like, well, and to be honest, it really isn't even that accurate. I remember for my 23 and me, it was like, to be honest, it was completely wrong. Like, it's like, you probably don't have a butt chin, which I'd add my eye color. I have a widow's peak, like all these things. And I was like, compl completely off. And to my understanding too, I think with most of those testings, um, they did more correlative stuff, I think, yeah. right. They just, they, they took a thousand genes and said, well, here's a thousand people, you know, seven of them have 700 of them have blue eyes. So this is the gene for that. Yep. Um, is that still kind of, you guys, do you guys take that as a base and play off it or what are you guys measuring? 
Yeah, so so we're, we're actually measuring uh, what the methylation on the DNA. So, you know, we're measuring just sort of uh, carbon groups, which are attached to the DNA at certain locations. Those locations are called CPGs. So really, they're just cytosine and guanine base pairs. Um, but it, they represent locations where we can attach carbons. And when we do, we essentially silence that gene. So whenever something's methylated, it's not being transcribed. And so, so we're really measuring that at, at really right around 900,000 locations in the genome. And then we're using the, some of those data sets where we essentially get a methylated or not. But we test you know, a lot of different copies of the DNA, so it becomes less binary. and really gives us a percentage of methylation at each location in the DNA. And then with that, we, we do some of those correlative analysis, right, where we're looking at, you know, it's the same way, you know, with high cholesterol, right? They didn't know what high cholesterol meant until they started to correlate that to people with high cholesterol have these cardiac-related outcomes, right? And mm -hmm. so it's a very similar process, except that unlike some of those investigations, which have been done in the past, we're able to leverage some really new science, not only in, in detection of these, these new sort of uh, methylation signatures, but even in the computer learning or how do we interpret those. So, right, so there's two parts of the process. The one is the first line, the baseline diagnostic, where we're able to get that information. The second is how do we actually interpret that? And we do that mm -hmm. with computer learning algorithms, which give us really great insight into different things, particularly what we look at mostly is, is this idea of biological age or how old is your body? And the reason that's important is because because age is the number one risk factor for all chronic disease and death. Um, but, but chronological age just doesn't quite cut it, right? You know, there's, yeah. there's so much phenotypic variation in, in age groups. Uh, this is a more objective metric to look at how people are aging and then be able to treat that. Aging is a disease because, I, you know, I think that as time goes along, aging will almost certainly be classified as, as a disease. It just got its sort of ICD-10 extension code uh, via the World <laughs> Health Organization. So, so we're making some progress. And I think that the more people realize that aging impacts and helps us sort of determine what diseases we get, the more they'll treat aging before they develop signs of, uh, of other types of diseases. Yeah, which is like the number one chronic disease, right? America, so that's probably our biggest bill right now. And as far as, man, we could go down the inflation rate and the economy right now. Um, but again, well, to take it... Yeah, I hate Go to ahead. interrupt, but you know, in, in that regard, there are two statistics which I always like to talk about in these things, which is that if everyone in the world reduced their their biological age rate by seven years, you'd cut disease in half. Morbidity would be cut by fifty percent. Wow. Um, the other one I like to mention is that if you cut the aging rate just by twenty percent in the United States, you save the U.S. over three trillion dollars in healthcare yeah. spending. And so, so there's no denying that the link between aging and disease has been happening for a while. But now we have a way to quantify it. If we can quantify it, that means we can start to treat it. Nice. Yeah. Get it, get ahead of the curve. Definitely. And, and I, so I have to peel my brain back a little bit back to, to biology and, and DNA and RNA and transcription. And, you know, when, when we think methylation right now, like I said before, I think, okay, I think of, I have a tyrosine, right. And I want to turn it into an epinephrine and then I want to break it down. So for instance, like I have mutations in my, my methylation, my MTHFR, I have mutations in my COMT, so I've always been under the assumption that like, I have to watch, right, how much tyrosine and then how many cofactors I have and how quickly I create epinephrine and yeah. knowing that I have a harder time breaking it down and making it. Um, and then what you're talking about here, as far as the actual process of methylation, just adding a carbon group, and that can increase, or turns on or turns off a reaction. And that's what we think about when we take tyrosine into epinephrine. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, in my brain, I need, I'm working on bridging. How do I bridge? Is any of that information relevant to where we're at right now when you're talking about yeah so they're all they're first off they're all intimately related right you know your ability to methylate you know any anything in your body not just the dna but as you mentioned even things like tyrosine or or as you're talking about you know homocysteine levels right yeah uh, which might be elevated because of a lack of methylation ability um and so they're all related uh because they're all happening with the fundamental process of how well does my body add those methyl groups to the places they needed to be at right and so, so you're looking at underlying biochemistry but if you take a step back you know, well, the gene expression is, is probably the first part in that central dogma of biochemistry, right? Where we start with DNA. With DNA, we go to, you know, uh, RNA, right? And we create that, that RNA based off our DNA signatures. That process is transcription. But with these methylation signatures in our DNA, that's what creates the, pro or I should say, what allows us to do or to not do transcription. You know, generally, if things methylated, it silences that gene. If things are acetylated, it sort of opens up those histones uh, so that you can get transcription factors in there. And so most of these CG codes that we actually investigate are found near the promoter regions of genes where, mm -hmm. you know, the transcription infrastructure would actually attach. And so all part of the same process, but, but looking at it for different reasons. 
um, we're sort of looking at it as the first step to tell us what's actually happening in a particular cell. Um, and, and, you know, for instance, there's even an intimate a correlation. We know that women, for instance, with a 677CC um, MTHFR variant are actually going to have worse biological aging processes because they are unable to methylate and therefore appropriately regulate that DNA, right? If you're not mm -hmm. able to turn genes off or turn genes on when you want, that can cause some big problems. You know, a classic example is tumor suppressor genes, right? Or yeah. oncogenes, right? Where you'd want to methylate those oncogenes so they don't cause cancer. And you want to make sure that those tumor suppressor genes are turned on so they can prevent those cancers. However, if you're not able to regulate those appropriately, like happens in a lot of ca cases of cancer, you start to develop, you know, uh, neoplasms, right? And, and that's mm -hmm. a problem. And so, so the idea is that you want the basic infrastructure of your body to work well. Um, but, but we're looking at something a little bit different, which is we're looking at actually what is the phenotype of your cell? What is expressed? What is not expressed? And then being able to relate that to different types of outcomes. Um, you know, one of the best examples outside of aging that there is are these liquid biopsies, um, which are, you know, these stage zero cancer detection tests. Um, actually, even just last week, uh, Grail uh, is a, a sort of a new biotech company that spun off from Illumina. They announced their first test at the cash pay test, uh, which is able to detect over 25 different types of cancers with just a single drop of blood, right? Wow. Um, really, really precise things, it, which goes to speak, to, I think, to some of the, the levels of, of sensitivity of this metric and why it's so promising is because it's, it's very, very precise. Um, and it doesn't just tell you, you know, if you have cancer, it's also able to tell you what type of cancer you might, you might be developing. And then you're able to make some interventions and changes. And so, so whenever I think about methylation and how it's used, at least clinically, diagnostically at the moment, the idea is it's able to detect things that, that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, and then really help us interpret that and then make changes before they manifest in some type of health phenotype, like, you know, a stage four cancer, or even in the case of aging, any type of chronic disease. Dude, that's crazy. I, and I don't know, I wonder how long I always get skeptical. You know, we were talking about the FDA and peptides and compounding pharmacies a little bit before and these testings and, and I get it, right? Like cancer is a big industry and, and it would actually be bad if we came in. I don't, how do I say that? How do I say that correctly? It'd be bad for money, right? It'd be bad for the, if we cured cancer, like there'd be people out of the job and I'm not, we won't get into too much of that. But when we look at something like this, that can absolutely transform the industry. Number one, I'm skeptical of it. So it's a single drop of blood and it can, it basically sees when the acetylation or methylation is happening and that leads to downstream effects. Is that yeah, how? Well, yeah, essentially, you know, what they do is they, they, they do a little bit something different than we do. We look at whole blood DNA. They're actually okay. making sure that they look at the cell free DNA, which um, is more correlative to certain types of cancer processes. Um, and whenever, what they're able to do is, is really, you know, take a large sample of cancer patients, see what methylation changes are most correlated to that type of cancer in those patients, mm. and then be able to predict those things off of very, very small levels where you can actually even detect it in stage zero in some cases before you would find it via any other uh, imaging diagnostic, any other clinical assay. So, so uh, you know, the, the grill is just one example, but there's probably not a single week that goes by that I don't see $100, $150 million investments going, going into these methylation related diagnostic companies where they're able to find cancer at really, really early, early stages. And so, um, you know, whenever I think about cancer now, I think there's a lot of innovative treatments, but even more probably exciting to me than that is the innovative diagnostics to catch it early and to intervene early. Um, and so it's all based on the same mechanism of looking at the DNA in our blood and looking at, at markers in that DNA, which might be indica indicative of, of some type of disease process. So how did you get, what in this area caught your attention? Was it playing with peptides or how did you all of a sudden, you know, obviously you're very, very well versed in your knowledge and peptides is, is man, it's, it's through the roof and your biology in general. What, was there something interesting in this field of paper one day or how did you just all of a sudden yeah. Yeah, get sucked one, in? One paper that, that sort of changed my entire philosophy on it. And it really, you know, I've been following this metric for a long time. The first time it came out was in 2013. Um, which was really the first time I heard about it. I was still in school at that point, and, and we, we sort of talked about it. Um, however, you know, I've been following it the year since, ever since I got into the peptide space and, you know, going through medical school. And, and it wasn't really being used clinically. You know, it was really sort of used as a, um, you, you know, this, this I, I don't know, almost like a parlor trick, right? Where it was being used to, to date refugees, right? To see if they were uh, applicable for asylum. Are they minors or are they adults? It was oh, being, really? Yeah, it was being That's used in cool. crime scenes, right? Yeah. Say, hey, we've got DNA of a person from a crime scene. We know, we know a lot of features from their DNA, but how old are they, right? That narrows down the suspect list 
pretty significantly. And yeah. so those were two examples, but wow. those aren't clinical examples, right? Those don't have yeah. anything to do with healthcare. And so they weren't exciting, but that all sort of changed in September of 2019. Um, in September of 2019, there was a, a study published, which I know you're probably familiar with, which is called the TRIM trial, which looked at metformin, growth hormone, and DHEA as a way to reverse the aging process. Oh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it was done at UC, sort of UCLA and, 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 you know, got a lot of notoriety, but also a lot of pushback because it only had nine patients, you know, it was only, uh, but, but with that being said, it was a proof of concept study, right? Where the, for the first time ever, not only do we have a way of, of seeing how, how old the body is, but we also have a way of reversing that process, right? We have a way to to now say, hey, we can make people younger. And that made me very, very excited. Within just a few weeks, I was in um, you know, the study's author's office, Dr. Horvath, um, <laughs> saying, hey, I would love to, who, who's the best company in, in the world doing this right now? Because uh, I want to vet all of these peptides, right? Because all of a sudden you have a 30-year placebo control trial instantaneously because you know these things are able to predict death, right? So you can actually look at these healthcare outcomes um, objectively saying, hey, how, you know, via this algorithm, how likely are we to reduce death or cardiovascular disease or, you know, some of these things. And, and it, it's still probably got a way to go in terms of being the best clinical diagnostic, but it's still a great way to orient yourself from an age perspective um, and, and then be able to make changes to, to really reverse the aging process. And so the metformin growth hormone in, in DHEA trial was just the first. And now there've been probably six or seven different interventional trials which shown to reverse this process. And, you know, in my mind, the, the peptides were high on that list, right? You know, uh, all the different peptides that people are doing for anti-aging benefit now we can actually look at them objectively to see how they're changing this aging process. And so uh, that's what got me into it in the first place, it got me excited to learn more about it. But, but unfortunately, I think that whenever I started to look at it commercially, there were a lot of companies who I thought were doing it in the correct fashion, which is, you know, instead of just providing one test, really collecting a lot of other data, because, um, you know, the, the effect of, of changing this metric um, you know, there's so much more development. It's almost like the DNA was 30 years ago where there's new things being created every day, new insights being learned. And, and I think that if you were just look at, you know, 200 places on the DNA, it's not enough. You really need to look at those 900,000 and then be able to update people on data and new things that come out as they go. And so with that idea, we sort of created this company True Diagnostics to be able to offer that to people. Okay. And that, because I'm already kind of reflecting on you know, when we're measuring blood, right? And blood, blood has already had its, its um, trial of fire of it versus urine versus saliva versus, and I, I'm old school mm -hmm. still. I still go by blood specifically just because number one, I think it's easiest to, I think we have the most clinical data behind it. And, and I, there are still time and places I'll use saliva and urinary. And what's also cool about from what I'm hearing is when we measure blood and we measure all these other urinary saliva, all these other biomarkers, it's already, it's already afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right. And what you're saying is like, well, we're going to go in and look at the infrastructure and see what's producing this testosterone of 400. Is that? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's still so new. I, you know, I want to stress that too, because as we go, we'll be able to find out insights for just about everything. I mean, recently there was a, um, from Europe, there was a study published on on the pharmacoepigenetics of metformin, where they can actually predict if someone's going to have a response or if they're going to have side effects of metformin. Wow. Right? I mean, that's a very important, you know, clinical assay which could be used yeah. by a lot of people. And so, so you know, the the, the impact of, of the this data set is limitless. You can really train it to just about anything. Train it to performance, right? Train it to see how many push-ups someone can do. You can actually do that, right? Um, but the other thing is that the tissue type of collection, as as you mentioned, is very very important because every cell in the body is going to have a different epigenetic expression, right? If we were to test your, you know, your, your brain tissue, we'd see much, much lower ages than the rest of your body. If we were to test your breast tissue, we would see much, much higher ages. And so the type of tissue matters. Um, and all these computer learning algorithms have been created off one type of, of tissue set, which is blood. Mm. And the majority of, of, of cells in the blood that, that actually produce DNA are those, those lymphocytes, so the immune system. Mm. Um, and, and it just so happens that that's perfect for aging because the immune system has a fundamental and important role in, in, in the aging process. And, and, and so with that being said, we only use blood, um, you know, but that's, you know, eventually there's going to be ways to look at all different types of tissue. You know, uh, we actually have a skin test that we're hopefully coming out here soon with to see the age of your skin. Um, and, then, and then also train that against predicting phenotypic outcomes like wrinkle depth or pigmentation or other uh, things of that nature. And so, uh, so yeah, finally, we have, a, you know, an objective way to look and predict these healthcare outcomes in a way that's a lot more predictive than other types of metrics. The best example I can usually give is telomeres. So, you know, telomeres uh, and telomere length have been, you know, one of the standard, you know, anti-aging biomarkers for a long, long time. But if you look at the, you know, the correlation value to age, 
you see at maximum telomere lengths usually have right around 0.32 or 0.35 um, R values. The R values for this are around 0.98 to 0.99, you know, significantly, significantly better against well, age. Yeah. Um, and even more predictive. And actually, we can even tell you your telomere length um, by just looking at your epigenetic methylation. So, you know, like I said, it can be trained against any outcome, which is why I think it's really the diagnostic of the future. Well, and what's cool about that, I, I've always been skeptical of the telomere. It, um, how do, you know, this is, this is, this rings true on my end, thinking about telomere length, cholesterol, IGF one, we deem it not right one way or the other. Oh, your cholesterol is high. It's because blah, 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 blah. I'm like, well, it's actually could be you're inflamed. You're it's an inflammation response and IGF one. You're probably very familiar. Some people are like, it's, it's, it's the devil. It causes aging. And some people are like, no, nah, it actually helps you regenerate. So it's funny. The telomere thing. I remember when I first started hearing about telomeres and I was looking at the research, I'm like, okay, you have one community of anti-aging. You're like, if we could just extend the telomeres, <laughs> things would be better. And I look at the cancer field and they're like, if we could just prevent, you know, <laughs> shorten the telomeres. Yeah. So I don't know. There's always like this balance that I think, you know, it's really easy in any field to right to get to one side or the other. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think that, you know, and it brings up a lot of other conversations, you know, right too, right? Like things like senescence, right? And, you yeah. know, and how you induce, you know, does telomere dysfunction induce senescence and then therefore lead to that inflammation process, which, you know, might be wreaking havoc. And so it, it, there's no doubt it's a complex process. But I think that the good thing about the methylation is that that it is, it's sort of metadata, right? You're looking at the bigger mm -hmm. picture. You're looking at, yeah. at you're using these things to predict healthcare outcomes. And as long as you have enough data and a large enough data set, uh, you can really start to have really high levels of predictive capability. And so, um, so you know, we're not, you know, all the, obviously all of these things are going to be, uh, you know, mimicking their effect uh, via some type of biological mechanism. But for us, you know, that can even be secondary, where first we're just trying to figure out, is there a correlation? And then once we find a correlation, we can really dive into to the, maybe the reason we might be seeing that. And that's what's happening here with this aging process, too, is that, you know, it looks like that these methylation epigenetic signatures might not just be correlated to aging, but might even be, you know, a causative process to the aging process. And we still don't really know what that is. We don't know why the, these epigenetic methylation signatures are so highly correlated to age prediction or to the, you know, predicting disease outcome, but we do know that they are highly linked. And so mm -hmm. that's what a lot of this research field is doing right now is trying to dive into that, some of that basic science and see the reason why we see such a high correlation between our methylation measurements and then obviously the biological age process and disease development. Yeah. And that's what, again, I always try and take a step back and be like, you know, chicken or the egg, right? Even with the methylation thing is like, is this, cause we get that all the time too, where, you know, more testosterone better, but it's like, well, we don't kind of like the cholesterol, cholesterol thing. Um, and I should have, I don't know if you have examples. I probably should have asked that if you have, but I'm curious. So is this is a blood test or kind of walk me through a pitch to a practitioner. Yeah. Like what, Ryan, why should I use your test? Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously you gave me a, a, a knowledge of data, but how do I use this with my patients and, and how do I go about doing it? Yeah. So fundamentally you have to understand, I think that the idea of aging is process. And, and there are a lot of other examples I could give in that regard. But, you know, um, it, one of the best examples I can give is that there's one algorithm that we have exclusively. It was developed by Duke and Columbia and the University of Otago in New Zealand. And, and this data set that they created, it, so it, it creates a rate of aging algorithm. So how fast are you aging right at this moment on a, on a scale of, you know, uh, you know, biological years per year, you know, how fast are you aging? And, and ideally, what you want to see is that you're aging less biologically than you are chronologically. So having a number lower than one, right? And so they started this data set in 1975 with a group of patients, over a thousand patients who were three years old. And every th six months, essentially, they would take all of these 19 related aging biomarkers, things like MRIs, uh, you know, audio, audio visitory tests, gait speed, strength, you know, all of these different measurements. And they were able to create this, this algorithm, which predicted aging. What they found, which is really, really interesting, is that even at age three, the rates of aging could actually predict what happened at age 45. Wow. Um, and, you know, from everything from retinal imaging scans to uh, memory processing speeds, the rate of aging was determined even by age three. And so wow. what this means for everyone is that there's no time too early to think about your own aging process, right? Even if you're, if you're 15, if you're 19, if you're 25. That's the time to start thinking about it. Not to mention that if you get into your 40s and 50s, where most people start to think, hey, I finally want to start, you know, treating my aging process, right, living a better life, that that's not the most ideal. The quicker you can do it, mm -hmm. the better. And so if you understand aging as a disease and understand that now we can actually view how you're aging, <laughs> the idea is that let's get a baseline, right? You know, the number one thing, you can't manage what you can't measure, right? And, and, and now you can actually measure it. And so even if you decide to do nothing, 
having an idea of where you're going is important because it helps you decide if you want to do something, right? And so, so baseline, I would say you have to understand aging is a disease and you have to understand that now we can measure it. And so you should probably measure it, right? Most people yeah. who are concerned about any type of health outcome um, would want to know that because it's correlated to cancer, cardiovascular disease, stroke, uh, you know, heart attack. It's correlated to the ability to, you know, how, how like you are to, to be frail or break your hip, right? All of those things that everyone thinks about on a day-to-day -day basis are the things that you can actually mitigate by just making an intervention change early. And so for practitioners like yourself, right, there's a lot of things that you're doing in clinical practice, even things you're doing with yourself. But the idea is, how do you know how they're affecting you, right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, and how do you make the decisions for the best one? You know, you and I both might take metformin, but metformin for me might really increase my aging rate, whereas for you, it might decrease your aging rate. And, and so obviously, we would hope to see really large scale trends of these things, but sometimes we don't, right? Everyone has a unique biochemistry um, uh, individuality, and we want to be able to treat that. And so the idea is that this gives you a baseline to then continue to, to monitor and measure so that you can decide the best aging interventions for your patients. Because again, if you treat that aging process, you're treating all other diseases, right, if, in a preventative fashion. And so that's sort of the idea is that now you can start to, you know, not just, you know, uh, read the latest literature and say, hey, resveratrol is great for you, right? But now we can actually say, hey, resveratrol is great for your aging process. And we can measure it by this test. And we can also measure you know, what concentration is best for you, right? And, and like, as I mentioned, these are 40 year placebo control trials in one because you can really start to see how it's affecting change. And then by that, it's related to every type of disease mathematically. So we can say, it's, you know, reducing your risk of cancer by this much or that much. You know, once this is this guy I always like to mention as well is that for every one year that you are older biologically than chronologically. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm 40 and my biological age is 45, right? Uh, if for every one year increase, you would actually, your risk of developing cancer in the next uh, five years would go up by 6%. So that would be a 30% increased risk of developing cancer in the next five years. Uh, you know, for every one year, you would increase your risk of dying of cancer in the next five years by 17%. So again, you'd be multiplying 17 times five to get that relative risk calculation in the next five years of how likely you are to die of cancer. So this is mathematically objectively tied to a lot of these chronic diseases. And so let's just say you have a patient who has a history of, of breast cancer or in their family. You can really start to even use this metric to see how their risk might be increased or decreased for that particular metric. Um, and, and so it, it's really connected to all of these different health outcomes. And for anyone who's treating anybody preventatively to maximize their health span and lifespan, this is, I think, an invaluable tool. That's awesome. And I mean, what's funny is, you, I mean, you probably get this with peptides, how often antioxidants, right? Oh, resveratrol, vitamin C, selenium, or like just go down the list, NAC, and how many times you read about a supplement, NNM, all these things are good for so many stuff uh, at, at, at so many things. I'm like, man, I don't know which ones to pick. And then patients come in and they're like, Hey, I'm on these 10 antioxidants. And I'm just like, I don't think it works that way. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Funny. It, and we're, we're, you know, we're working on that. So we have over 20 approved IRB trials, looking at everything from NMN to NAD infusions to be able to quantify some of the effect that we see from some of these treatment regimens, everything from, you know, uh, uh, alpha ketoglutarate to, you know, uh, terostilbene to, to satinib and course and synolytics, right? We're measuring That's all cool. of these different points to see if they can be picked up and what effect that has on the multi, a lot of different algorithms, everything from telomere length to, you know, the rate of aging to the, you know, immune system age or whatever it might be. We can even look at your immune cell subsets. So we can actually predict how many T cells you have, how many B cells, your CD4 to CD8 ratio, all with one test. And so again, you know, the, this test, this sort of uh, diagnostic area is just beginning, but the, you know, at, we, we do it now over 15 different reports. And out of those 15 different reports, we're still using less than 2,500 locations on your genome, wow. we're measuring 900,000. So, you know, this, this test in the future is going to be one test, which yields a lot of information for you. That's crazy. Well, and I feel that way, a little, a little quick side tangent uh, with, with nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. To my understanding, the clinical literature when I first got in the game and I was working at GNC, right? It was first arginine and then arginine with a Krebs cycle, like a alpha ketoglutarate, which I personally feel still works the best. And then it all moved to citrulline, right? All the clinical research is now citrulline, like a citrulline malate. Um, what do you, what do you, uh, just real quick side tangent, nitric oxide. Do you take any NO stuff? You, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the daily stalophil. Um, yeah. instead of the five milligram daily tadalafil, but obviously, you know, uh, uh, citrulline, I do a lot of arginine. I do a lot of, um, you know, even I think some of the beetroot data looks pretty good now. Yeah. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of different things, but, but for me, I'm definitely a proponent of the daily tadalafil. 
Cool. All right. I do that every once in a while, but I'm, I'm a, that, well, it's funny is I'll go to the gym and I just feel like I notice a difference from, and then what's the agmatine too? Like the yeah. different, like yeah. agmatine. What is that one? I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. A, a, agmatine, a mag, a mag, what is it? It's not a G it's, it's, there's an M in there or something, but yeah. I'll shoot you some data. And I just love to hear your, I know your nose deep in that stuff all the time. So I'm like, uh, yeah. I'm always playing with it. And, you know, again, I try and read it. And then when I apply it, I just honestly, I don't get the same pumps on citrulline that I did from, from it. Yeah. From a Tadatafil or from an arginine. Yeah, so true. the test is it, so it's blood or how do I, if yeah, I'm like, sorry. Hey, I want to try it out. What do I, you know? Yeah, I mean, no, I missed that prompt earlier, but yeah, you know, it's it, the, the good news is that, um, you know, this can be something that anyone can order, even direct to consumer. However, cool. I would highly, highly recommend going through a practitioner because the level of insight that we're able to give practitioners versus direct to consumer is substantially larger. And so I think that that highly would recommend going through a physician to order this testing. Um, you know, what we would typically do is just send you a kit in the mail where you would prick your finger, um, oh. you know, collect a few drops of blood. Really, all we need is right around three to six drops of blood. Uh, you send that back to us in about two weeks. We, we sort of do that methylation based analysis. Analysis, um, and then create a multitude of, of, of insights for you. Everything from, as I mentioned, telomere length to uh, immune system age to the, your overall biological age to uh, you know whether or not you're likely to become uh, diabetic or obese, or if you're likely to respond to weight loss interventions like caloric restriction. Um, you know, and, and hopefully building that out even to be more expansive to things like what is your senescence burden, right? Are you, you going to be highly likely to respond to things like senolytics or, you know, a lot of those aging related uh, uh, markers. And so, um, so right now it can be happened to your physician, but the idea is that uh, once you get those baseline, you might wait six months to a year. It's not the most precise testing, uh, at least at the moment. So we do recommend no more than once every six months. Um, you know, probably, you know, if you, if you can do it, you know, twice a year, because again, this is the metric, which is most highly correlated to all those chronic diseases. So, so we definitely recommend prioritizing it, but, but no more than twice a year. And then, and then making changes to your diet, lifestyle, nutrition. One of the things about epigenetics is it, it's not just about medications. It's not just about diet or fitness. It's all of those things, right? It's it's even how much pollution you're exposed to or how much sunlight you're exposed to all of those things will play an impact in how your genes are regulated. And so, uh, so living a healthier life, you know, most of the, the recommendations that we know now have been epidemiological in basis, right? So looking at these large scale data sets and running these analysis on them and to see what's correlated. And, and, and obviously the things which are correlated now are pretty intuitive, right? Low pollution, you know, healthy diets, things like Mediterranean diet. Um, but what we're going to start to get is much, much more uh, precise recommendation to say, hey, this is your methylation status. Here's what we'd recommend. Um, and it's still a very, very new field, but the, the developments are happening on a daily basis. It's becoming very, very exciting. Cool. And then, so from a practitioner, as I'm going through this data and let's say I have a patient, we, and even myself and I work on it, um, like you're saying, a lot of dietary and lifestyle stuff are, are correlated or how do I say that? Can the, the data can be interpreted in a way that I can, I can know, um, tr I don't want to say treatments, but things that can be plug and play, right? So are there some things that you guys are integrating? Like, hey, I know, like I said, we know you're, you're big into peptides. You're like, okay, we know this marker. We're going to start using 5-amino or, you know, CJC or anything in, in those areas. Are there some things that you're excited about there? Yeah, so so I, I the answer is absolutely. However, with that being said, there are different levels of scientific you know criteria, right? How how confident do we feel about some of these recommendations? And one of the problems with a lot of the peptides is that there's not a whole lot of data sets out there, particularly publicly available data sets that we're able to reference, right? You know, most hospital studies like the Framington Heart Study aren't going to be using growth hormone or you know uh, or synolytics, right? <laughs> well, and testosterone, so, right? Yeah, testosterone, yeah, definitely. Okay. And, and and the work the work there is is growing rapidly, which is why we're doing so much research. Um, uh, but, but with that being said, we at the moment are still a little bit limited in what type of interventions we're going to be able to tell you to do. And, and most of it is specific to the algorithm that we're using to interpret. So uh, for instance, one of the things we do is intrinsic aging versus extrinsic aging. And the reason those two things are important are because the treatments associated with each are different, right? So we might test you, for instance, and see that your intrinsic aging is much, much higher than your extrinsic. And so that would say, hey, we want to treat your intrinsic aging. And then with that, we would go to the clinical literature and say, what have we found to be associated with lowering that intrinsic aging process? Um, and, and a lot of it might be intuitive, right? A lot of things like caloric restriction, you know, vitamin D supplementation, um, you know, things like DHEA. Uh, and, and so, but with that being said, we do have a list of, of, of things that have been 
scientifically validated to effectively reduce that metric. And so we do have recommendations we can give. Unfortunately, we're a little bit less able to do that directly to a, a patient because we don't have a clinical relationship, which is why yeah. I highly recommend going to practitioners because there's so much more information that they could give you than we could directly. Yeah. And is there anything in those areas that, that maybe you found or discovered that you feel comfortable sharing? Like for instance, yeah. I like testosterone, yeah. right? What do you, is there any data as far as this test? Cause I, I'm still kind of like the IGF one and growth hormone. I'm still in this place of do these cause aging, but also, right. We get cellular turnover, mm -hmm. but there's that also, it's still repairing and making you feel better. You know, I'd prefer to be 60 and lifting weights than to be, you know, I'd, I'd rather die earlier and be health and, and to be moving, right? Yeah. The, the good thing about these metrics is that they're, they're both validated to, you know, better metrics mean better health span and better lifespan. So yeah. you're not just living, you know, a life that is, you know, filled with, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the disability of doing things, right? You, you're yeah. able to actually live life one. And so as we talk about things like hormones and, and, you know, particularly testosterone, the answer is we don't know. However, I will say with that, that, that IGF one, um, the, you know, again, obviously people, you know, say higher IGF one levels are correlated with earlier mortality. Uh, mm -hmm. but one thing that I would say from an epigenetic perspective is that growth hormone DHA and metformin trial, obviously, which is increasing growth hormone and therefore increasing IGF-1 did show reductions in this biological aging process. The whole trial was really designed to actually regenerate the thymus, right? That immune organ uh, that we all have and that decreases with age, which is why we, you know, people who are older get the vaccine first, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, so with all that being said, you know, uh, the, the data on IGF-1 still is limited, but we do know that the TRIM trial, at least with only nine patients, but uh, was a was a positive thing to say that maybe you know growth hormone levels are regenerative uh, from this from this biological aging process that we can detect via these objective markers. Yeah, and and again, when I get frustrated because there are certain things that I think are kind of um, how do I say that self explanatory. Like a lot of the I we see high IGF one in society mostly due to high consumption of sugar. And just diet and lifestyle, right? The IGF one isn't coming from a fast, it isn't coming from a, a good workout. It's coming because we have high amounts of PCOS and we have blood uh, sugar dysfunction and type two diabetes and overconsumption of calories. So I understand, and that's you know what I'm saying like that's downstream. It's not the you know like the 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 oh, aging yeah. is happening here. So I'm yeah. just always super skeptical again when people and I get it. We want to. You know, when I run a blood test on someone and their IGF one is a hundred or it's two twenty, you know, they're like, "What do I do with this info?" And I'm like, "Well, we got to look at how it got there, right?" Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, another. It, I mean, the, that's just the human body, right? It's so complicated. You have to look at it in multiple different levels. But again, you know, I think that the, the good thing about the methylation is that you can design these algorithms to predict out uh, something that is relatively. Uh, you know, meta, right? Larger picture, which then can help inform a lot of your other clinical decisions. And 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 again, as this market develops, uh, you'll have even more things that will help you dive into clinical decision making. One of the things I always like to mention is outside of the aging process. One of the things that we look at are a couple markers which are highly correlated to uh, diabetes development. Where if you read at increased risk for these things, you know, we typically highly recommend intervention right then because if you can you can intervene early with something that is highly predictive of a certain type of outcome, the better you are avoiding that outcome. And so uh, we have a, a di couple diabetes markers, which are again, highly predictive of, 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 of insulin you know, <laughs> resistance. And so uh, you can actually make changes immediately. And so we do everything from the larger picture to a more immediate, um, more actionable uh, things like these low size specific reports that we do. Sweet. Um, do you, I probably should ask you for the podcast. Do you have a screen share that you could show us the lab test, what it looks like or yeah, absolutely. So, so we, they're also available on our website, uh, and I'll try and bring them up just here real briefly. Okay. Um, and if not, I'll probably do an intro, and yeah. I'll 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 pull it up and kind of talk through from what I've learned. Yeah. No, I, I'd be happy to. Uh, hold on. Let me just uh, try and get this up real quickly. But um, but yeah, you know, like I said, we do a lot of these things, um, and so some of the reports, um, you know, are, are pretty diverse. And so I'd love to go ahead and just uh, real quickly share my screen, and then we'll we'll try and record that as well. Got it. You and your many, many tabs. <laughs> oh, I don't think I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. 
Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. So yeah, no, I've got a, you know, this is only one window of my multiple tabs. So, uh, um, but, but yeah, you know, this is, this is an example of, of one of our, our reports, which I already mentioned earlier, which is this instantaneous rate of aging report, which uh, again, sort of gives you the speedometer of how fast you're aging right at this moment. Um, and, and, you know, this is, uh, is, is one of the most predictive algorithms there are out there. Uh, for instance, even with a, uh, um, you know, a, uh, a, a methylation sort of pace of aging even slightly above one, um, you actually increase your risk of death within the next seven years by 56%. You mm -hmm. increase your risk of uh, some type of chronic disease in the next seven years by 54%. So, I mean, these are incredibly predictive. One of the other things I always like to show about this as well um, in relationship to uh, uh, this, um, this graphic is actually that the effect that this actually can even have on the outward appearance. Um, so this is one of my favorite things to show people because you do age from the inside out. And so this is a uh, computer generated images of, of these cohorts. Uh, again, all of these people are the same age, but if you look at the 10 fastest aging members of the cohort, they look remarkably older than those 10 slowest aging members of the cohort. And so it goes to show you that, that age just doesn't impact your risk of all of these chronic diseases, which we talk about, but even your outward appearance, how fast you're aging, um, you know, to the eye. And so, so this is one of my favorite, uh, um, you know, algorithms, which is, you know, predictive of just about everything, including, you know, even, even how, how you can cognitive process and, and, you know, how big your brain is and the surface area of your brain, all of which correlate to, you know, your ability to, to think and process. And so this is one of my favorite algorithms, but the report itself, um, you know, looks a little bit like the one you saw earlier, which, um, essentially shows this pace of aging. It talks a little bit about this metric, talks about how quickly it can change and why it can change. Um, and then ultimately breaks down your, your final results. So how fast are you aging and what are the risks associated with it? Um, you know, in addition to that, we have uh, uh, several other reports out there. You know, this is uh, one of our drinking reports, which tells you, uh, you know, how much are you drinking at the moment, which, you know, uh, might not be something you want, but it, it's always good <laughs> to know how it reflects on your overall health status. So we can actually tell you if you're a mild, moderate or heavy drinker at this moment, the moment you do our test, um, we can even tell you how much you've smoked across your entire lifetime. We're able to tell you if you're likely to become obese uh, by looking at these low site specific reporting um, and, and, and multitude of other reports as well. One of my favorites um, that I, I'll try and throw up here as well is the immune report that we do, where we look at intrinsic and extrinsic age, and we even break down some of these immune cell subsets. So we're actually able to look at your intrinsic age, your extrinsic age, and actually look at, at your percentage of immune cells. Uh, you know, the CD4 to CD8 ratio is, is something you would want between one and four. And, and we've actually been able to, to pick up patients with immunosuppressed um, conditions via HIV or, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia um, all through this test. And so again, this is just one test that reads out a lot of these different insights. And and it will only continue to grow with time. We typically put out a new report about every four weeks or so, uh, uh, you know, especially for our practitioners where we can go into more, um, you know, detail uh, disease oriented um, data. Uh, but, but again, the, the, the thought process is that this is really limitless in what we're able to do. And, and we'd even do things like telomere reporting, which are, you know, standards that the people have been using forever, but we're much more sensitive and much more accurate and we're much more predictive of different disease outcomes. Yeah. And that, that those are, you know, super cool. Like as far as the, uh, you know, like with the immune system, right. Automatically my mind goes to like, Oh, that'd be great. Thymus and alpha, right. Yeah. My brain starts thinking peptides. And, um, we talked a little bit kind of, kind of whatever you're comfortable with. I'd like to bring up kind of peptides where you see their safety at, and, uh, I'll preface it a little bit on, on my end. I've been a big advocate from peptides kind of from the beginning. And I mean, I came from the bodybuilding world, right? So I had friends, I personally never took anything um, any exogenous stuff until I got out of clinical practice. And I took an, I've taken, I've been, I've taken DRT, I've done inclomiphene, I've done Clomid, I've done, um, a lot of different things in that area. Um, but when I first, I first heard about MK677 was the first peptide I heard about probably like 2014 or 15, a friend of mine said, Hey, you know, look into this. And most of the clinical trials I saw, they're small, right? Um, the safety seems like it's there. Right. But I'd love to hear your feedback. You're in the industry for a while. You're kind of shifting where you're going with things. I'd love to hear your feedback on like loved ones, friends and family. I know you've personally taken some of them. And that's kind of always my thing with with safety, because we have the FDA coming in and saying this isn't safe or this isn't safe. Yet we have, you know, something being rolled out now that's only been around for a year. So yeah. I don't yeah. know where, where your thoughts with with kind of where that's going. You know, yeah, the, the peptide, uh, I'd say the realm of peptides now is something that 
that actually really saddens me quite a bit. You know, I think that um, there are varying degrees of evidence with each of these products. Yeah, and some of them are right. And there's differences between all of them. Some are safer. Absolutely. They've been around longer. And obviously yeah, exactly. you have to, you have to absolutely evaluate it on a individual basis. Uh, right. Where you, you talk about, um, you know, even uh, by process, right. We know things like things that increase growth hormone IGF one, there are things that increase growth hormone IGF one that we've been using for decades. Whereas, you know, we talk about novel synolytics, maybe like a Fox 4 DRI, it's very, very new, right? And so yeah. you, you have to you have to approach each very, very differently. Um, but, but the thing that makes me sad about the current state of peptides is not necessarily, um, I would say that, that less research is being done or that these things are any less exciting. It's the fact that, that essentially options have been limited. Um, especially options to a lot of clinical practitioners. Um, due to some of the new leg FDA related legislation issues, um, a lot of, of how these things have been regulated have, have changed pretty significantly, meaning that, you know, for instance, even look at MK677, as you mentioned, you know, it's a small molecule that increases growth hormone, but is no longer available because it's not FDA approved. And now, mm -hmm. you know, typically compounding pharmacies were doing this for patient specific prescriptions from, um, you know, licensed providers who were then uh, deciding if it was right for a patient. And now compounding pharmacies can no longer produce anything which is not FDA approved. Um, and so that's sort of the new legislation, which means that a lot of times when the physician thinks it's the right course of action for their patient, they're not able to get a supply of a medication which they think they might need. Um, you know, and, and this doesn't just apply to things which are not FDA approved. It, it now even applies to things which have been widely used and widely FDA approved for a long time, like, as we mentioned, even before our call, the human, you know, HEG, right, which is, you know, this, this molecule, which can, again, help with, you know, fertility, in some cases, help with, you know, preservation of, of testicular volume uh, with men on testosterone. Now, even compounding pharmacies aren't allowed to compound that, even though it's been a highly reliable, uh, you know, <laughs> medication to compound for quite some time due to change in FDA legislation on what is or is not a biologic. And so, um, you know, I think that all of these changes have really vastly limited, uh, I should say, really regulated compounding pharmacies, which is not necessarily in and of itself a bad thing, but it's, it's also greatly limited physician and patient supply. And I think that that is unfortunately pushing people through a little bit more disreputable sources uh, and, and limiting the ability for physicians to to use the treatment they think is best and they've been trained to, to really recommend. Yeah. And, and from a pragmatic standpoint, please, you know, correct me if I'm wrong from what you saw in the industry. When, when I think compounding pharmacy, I think exactly what you're thinking about. We, Pfizer and Merck and these big companies, they mass produce drugs. Mm -hmm. And then a compounding pharmacy, because they're smaller, number one can do it cheaper and they can do it more individualized. So if I have a guy where I can only get 200 milligrams per ml of testosterone and he's really bad with the needle. And I'm like, Hey, we can do a 50 milligram per ml. Cause this is too much. I can call up my buddy at the compounding pharmacy and say, Hey, I have this patient. Yeah. And I get where the FDA says, Whoa, what are you guys doing over there? We can't regulate it because it's too particular. Right. And that's, and for instance, too, with ACG, they view that as something as the compounding pharmacies are doing what they want with it. So there's no standard for lack of a better term, standard of care. So they come in and they regulate it or they just straight take it away. Yeah. You know, it, it really all results from one instance, which was in 2013, the new England compound incidents, which I, I think that anyone can Google, but the, the idea was that there was a, a very bad actor in the compounding space um, that resulted in deaths, uh, you know, and, and that rightfully so should have been acted on and, by by the government, right? You, yeah, that is, that is completely unacceptable. And, and so, so yeah. what happened? What you're saying is, if they had a 200 uh, milligram per ml, they sent it to a patient. It was actually like 10,000 per ml, and, and something bad happened, right? Well, you know, that, that that is definitely a possibility. But in this case, what was happening is that they actually provided medications which were which had sort of fungal meningitis, um, and oh, as a result, yeah. oh, it, you know, these, these patients developed meningitis and then passed away. And and there there should be, um, and there are rules and regulations to prevent that from happening. Uh, for instance, you know, for any product to go out of door of a compounding pharmacy, they actually have to receive a sterility report to say that that product, um, you know, tested by a third party source uh, has, has validated that it's sterile, doesn't contain any microbes or fungus or anything which would cause a negative reaction for the patient. The problem is that pharmacy wasn't really applying or, or adhering to the rules, right? Yeah. And so, so I think that, you know, the, the idea is that a lot of this regulation that came out of that incident um, 
you know, doesn't necessarily address the, the reason that incident happened, which was that there were bad actors who weren't even following the rules and regulations as they were. Um, and so, so I think that, you know, I, I cannot at all blame the, the, any regulatory agency, state, federal, anyone for trying to prevent that outcome. Um, yeah. But I do believe that there are maybe some other ways to be a generally a little bit less restrictive to, to really give, uh, you know, a, a lot more certainty to the outcome you're providing. Um, you know, potency testing, making sure the product is, as you mentioned, the right dose, right? Um, sterility testing, making sure the product is sterile and, and safe to inject. You know, those are two baseline things which happen on every batch that is made from any compounding pharmacy you go to. Yep. Um, and, and so, so more of that reg legislation would have, would have been great. I, I think that, that, you know, as it relates to some of these peptides and new innovative products, now they're just unfortunately disappearing. And, and I think that, um, especially for patients who had, had already been in this market and experienced some of the benefits of this medication is, is a really negative uh, thing. Uh, but, but I can completely understand the thought process. I just think that the actual implementation probably could have been a little bit more specific to make sure that, 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 uh, that people were still being able to, to have the medical consequences they want and need from their providers. Yeah, and, and I get it specifically too, when you're doing IV, IM, orally, I'm a little more liberal. Um, I think, what, did they just took away calcium chloride or one of the chlorides, right? Yeah, I mean, they, you know, it, real, right now, to sort of, to make sure that everyone also understands the rules and regulations, I think that it's important to know what most people are running into, which is that um, compounding pharmacies are now unable to, to compound anything, which is not on what they call the 503A bulk drug substance list. So basically, if it's not FDA approved, part of the national formulary monograph or the USP monograph, it has to be on this list of, of available things from the FDA. Um, the problem is that you're not even allowed to submit anything new to that list. So let's just say mm -hmm. that, for instance, we just created, you know, this, uh, this molecule and went through, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients testing, we'd have no way of getting it onto that list because the mm -hmm. submissions have been closed. And so I think that there are, there are some problems with the process, which, which definitely need to be remedied in order to make sure that, that, you know, compounding pharmacies are able to do what they do, which is meeting specific patient needs. Um, and, and as dictated by the physician that's managing their care and has been trained to do this. Um, and, and so I, I think that, you know, the pharmacies hopefully are, are a great tool ultimately a great tool of the physician, right? And, and, and being able to, to, I think that a lot of times they're trying to regulate what the physician can and cannot do via the supply that they can get, because that's how the FDA, you know, the FDA doesn't have a lot of jurisdiction over individual providers, but they do have just jurisdiction over all of these pharmacies. Yeah. And that's obviously what we're seeing. I mean, with TaylorMade and a lot of, I get absolute, the, these different pharmacies are pretty much email me every day saying, Hey, we can't get you this anymore. We can't get you this anymore. And it's not because it's necessarily safety. Right. Because that's a big concern when I when I have patients, I'm like, hey, we can't get CJC Anthem Relin anymore. And they're like, wait, what happened? Is it bad? Is it unsafe? Um, to my understanding, none of that's really changed. Yeah. You know, the, right? the, I mean, the, yeah, the, the, you know, they, they are not making any statements on efficacy of any type of medication. What they're saying is that, that it doesn't have the necessary criteria, meaning that it's not FDA approved. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it, whenever you think about what the criteria is needed, you know, in order to take a drug to market, it takes right around $2.3 billion. Yeah. You know, who has $2.3 billion? <laughs> Only a few companies, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, going through that process. And so, uh, you know, it greatly restricts the ability to be um, innovative, uh, but, but the, you know, the, and it greatly increases the time to be innovative. Um, and, and so not to say that that's a bad thing. You know, I think that if, you know, if there were a lot of bad actors in this space, that would make perfect sense. Um, but I think that, you know, if you look at some of the, the really large metadata about incidents of reactions and negative events, um, they're, they're relatively sparse with some of those medications we've already talked about. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, it's unfortunate as well that there's not been more of a movement um, from the integrated medicine community. People who are, you know, interested in using this medication to stick together and gather that data to present. Um, I think that that uh, hopefully is one thing that true diagnostics can help with, with some objective data to be able to say that these things are having a positive or negative consequence. Well, there's even minor nuances too, right? Like, is it even the dosage? Like, and I think like methylated B12 versus hydroxy versus, right? And you can't even mix certain things. And I get it. Their yeah. job is safety. That's why, that's yeah. why yeah. they're there. Yeah, And definitely. there's some little nuances. It's like, really? Methyl? Yeah, the, the nuances, you know, the more and more you dig into it, get, get even, you know, uh, 
even smaller, right? Uh, um, but but all that to be said, you know, I, you know, the compounding pharmacies are, are highly regulated. There, and and I think that. Uh, uh, you know, anyone who's using a compounding pharmacy shouldn't be scared because they're a compounding pharmacy. Um, you know, I think that they, they, but this limits the types of things they're able to do. And I still think that this, uh, you know, having a, a, a script that's, you know, by, by a licensed physician to a pharmacy, which is regulated by state and federal governments, you know, uh, pharmacies have to be regulated by each state they're approved in, as well as the FDA. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, that, that is a high level of oversight. Um, considering that, that the alternative is, is people going elsewhere to get some of these things, which might be much less reliable. Um, and, and so I think that uh, I, I was hoping that that might be a consideration in some of this, this policy, but unfortunately it hasn't been. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it's just a new realm of, of, of medicine. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of in a space where, you know, we haven't seen before, but, but I think it, it's definitely, there's no denying it's a safer space, but it, it, it's, I should say the options are much more limited, meaning that, you know, that, that you have, less ability to impact change for some of your patients. Yeah. Uh, how are you doing on time? I know we're running a little, you, yeah, no, no, you know, uh, I've got probably, you know, 10 more minutes if that's okay with you. That's perfect. Cause I had about just two more things. I, I, I want to ask you about your personal, uh, stack right now, but then also the level of discrepancy between for the, from the oral perspective, right? Like what is FDA approved? I can take a B, I can take methylated B12 orally, and a, and a compounding pharmacy can make that or not even anymore? Yeah, they can. Yeah. So, so the hydroxo and methylcobalamin, those are, are, are products which most compounding pharmacies are still doing. Um, however, you know, compounding pharmacy, you know, I, I like to use the example of stevia, right? You know, stevia, you can buy it in a kilogram at, at your local grocery store. But compounding pharmacies aren't allowed to, to use it. You know, we can't actually use it to flavor our trochees. We can't use it for anything because it's not an FDA approved ingredient and it's not on the inactive list. And yeah. so you look at, you know, uh, and that, that's, again, is a point of frustration because, you know, how are some of those, you know, supplements or how are, are things, you know, from a food perspective regulated versus, you know, what compounding pharmacies who are high, have high levels of oversight um, yeah. are not able to do. And so there is a, you know, uh, whenever you step back and look at certain ingredients, it doesn't make much intuitive sense, right? Um, but, but with that being said, I think that uh, hopefully those, those discrepancies will be cleared up in the future. Um, but right now, compounding pharmacies are, are even more limited than your supplement. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was kind of getting. I'm like, you would think that in a sterile uh, certified pharmacy, they're putting safe stevia, right, into my Tadatafil trochee versus i don't know when i go to whole foods and i get my cookie that has stevia in it like yeah so. it, you know whether it's made in a gmp compliant facility you know sometimes you just don't know right uh, you don't know where the product is sourced from if there's been any testing on it you know and, and so i would say that at this point the pharmacy world is definitely way more regulated than yeah. the supplement world but also has less options which again is not very intuitive but uh, i hope will be fixed in the, in the, in the future so well, how do you see the oral peptides like a BPC-157 oral or a dihexa or are yeah, those, so gonna, those are gone or? Dihexa is definitely gone. I know dihexa is. Yeah, oh, the, I like the, that one. <laughs> yeah, you know, so generally the, again, for, for anyone who, who is wanting to vet these things appropriately, usually if, if it has an IND or an investigational new drug application, it is strictly not a supplement category anymore. There are exceptions to that rule. Um, but the IND is a really good example of that. And so, um, you know, things like dihexa, uh, which have INDs, would not be able to be done in a compounding pharmacy or as a supplement because it's, you know, the dihexa additionally is not naturally occurring. Um, and, and so naturally occurring products are actually a big criteria for, mm. uh, for supplement based things. And so things like the BPC, which can be found as an endogenous peptide and things like stripe or in haggis, even, you know, and, and some of those other things that might have more of an argument for being, you know, a natural therapeutic remedy or an extract, uh, even things like, you know, some of the thymocins, which, you know, unfortunately have INDs, but thymus extract is something that's been done as a supplement for a long, mm -hmm. long time. And thymus fraction five contains things like thymus and alpha one, thymus and beta four. And so, um, so I think there's, you know, there's some gray area where things are naturally occurring, especially with a lot of the peptides, because those peptides are the natural building blocks of, right. If we talk about that central dogma of biochemistry, right. That DNA to RNA, RNA to peptides and proteins, right. So a lot of those natural things that, that are in our body and, and we can maybe change levels of, um, um, might be regulated as a supplement, but it's got to be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, you know, I think in, in order to uh, to make sure that that 
the, the adequate legal framework is, is being applied. And so, you know, uh, unfortunately, I would say that, that um, most of the peptides which are, are used now will probably not be around much longer. Um, uh, and, you know, even some of the things which have been highly validated, things like tessamorelin, right? Um, that, unfortunately, due to the same rules and regulation change that happened with HEG, is no longer able to be compounded because it's over 40 amino acids. And that makes me a little bit more, I would say, frustrated because that, that change, the, the sort of the arbitrary designation of 40 amino acids or less being um, not considered a biologic, uh, was put in a spending bill, you know, a 1700 page spending bill on December 31st, you know, it was signed into legislation. And then March 23rd, uh, you know, after that December, it, it was enacted as into law. And, and really, there, I would say there's not a lot of um, uh, scientific rationale for, you know, 40 amino acids versus 50. Or I, I think that probably the better designation would be chemically synthesized versus recombinantly produced, which is generally mm. grown in things like bacteria, right? So I think that, you know, uh, some of those things are a little bit more frustrating because it seemed to be driven by, um, you know, uh, I would say more of uh, an undereducated scientific community such as Congress rather than the FDA itself. And so, um, you know, there, it, it can be frustrating at some times as we talk about limitations um, which directly impact patient care. And especially when you're seeing those, those impacts on the patients that you treat or the ones that we interact with. And so um, it can be frustrating at times, but, uh, you know, I would say that right now the, the peptide world is unfortunately um, probably on its way down rather than becoming something to be really excited about. Well, and there, it's still, Tessamorelin is still available commercially as a, a grifta, uh, yeah. Grifta, and, and which is like uh, 10 grand a month or something, right? Exactly. You're looking at uh, 7,500, <laughs> if not covered by insurance. And so, um, again, you know, in, in a medication that was selling from compounding pharmacies for less than 500. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, and, 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 and that's another sort of frustration as well as, you know, uh, drug prices, right? Um, and, you know, you, you, the economies of scale that someone like a drug manufacturer would go through would make those prices actually much, much lower, but their margins have to be higher to facilitate all of the other things that they do. Um, but all of those other things that they do and applying a cost to that is, you know, sort of clouded in, in lack of transparency. And so it's hard to know if, if a price you're paying is actually justified or not. Yeah. We're, I, yeah. Well, leading that into my last question, then are whatever you're comfortable with. I don't know what you're, are you still playing with some peptides or some things that you're excited about or anything coming down the pipeline that you've been eyeing up? <laughs> You know, always, you know, uh, uh, you know, I think that, um, that there are a lot of really interesting things, even in the growth hormone releasing hormone realm, um, there's some new things out that look to be even better than, you know, tessamorelin, where you'd only have to do a once a week injection um, and get similar IGF-1 increases. Um, you know, there are um, some other things even for, you know, gut dysfunction, like I'm a big fan of a, a peptide called the razotide, um, which can help with gluten intolerance, um, hmm. and, and, you know, which is a, a major problem. And so uh, even, you know, more advanced than and skincare ingredients uh, that, that sort of mimic the effect of rapamycin as a synostatic. Um, you know, there, there's a whole list of things that I would say are still exciting from a research development standpoint. It's just harder now, I would say, to, to use them or to find them in a reliable source. And so personally, I, I've probably taken a little bit of a step back in terms of uh, some of my stacks have become a little bit less, yeah. uh, a little bit less elaborate. Uh, but, but with that being said, uh, you know, definitely gone into, um, you know, measuring my epigenetics more often, and then seeing what affects me personally, and, and making sure that, that I'm aging most appropriately. So hopefully, by the time that I'm 80, a lot of these rules and regulations might have changed back. <laughs> nah, then you can get on it. I actually have one last question in clomiphene. Yeah. When so I, um, to my understanding, clomid, two isomers, zuclomiphene, and clomiphene, and clomiphene is more uh, uh, LH sensitive. It helps increase testosterone more. Um, when I was digging through kind of the research, it looked like they had some good trials and then they just stopped. I think 2017. Do you know anything about that? Like, I, so usually for most of the, the medications we'd worked with in the past, I would know a lot about the development pathways, but that's actually yeah. one I do not know about. And I don't know yeah. why it was stopped. Um, although, you know, I, I will say that in my experience, I have seen a lot of medications being bought by other pharmaceutical companies as ways just to kill those medications and, 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 and maintain market share. Um, so, you know, I, I would definitely look to see who owned those patent rights and then any major transactions. But but ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the enclomiphene is actually one thing that compounding pharmacy can keep doing. And the reason being is that it is part of an FDA approved drug. Um, so being a part like of an isomer one. of clomid, uh, compounding pharmacies are actually still able to offer that. Ah, okay, cool. That one, that's one I want to hold on to. I've used that one. I've straight like clomid. I had a lot of guys, they get a little too estrogenic is the best way to put it. Yeah, just don't exactly. feel well on it. And the enclomiphene seems to kind of 
especially with ACG gone now too. So it's yeah, like, exactly. exactly. And, you know, a lot of people were trying to use the, I think in clomiphene and clomid as a way to maintain testicular volume while on testosterone. I think that, that that didn't get a great response. I think that you really have to do it, uh, you know, probably separately. It seems like most of what the data suggests, but it probably still has a mild benefit. Yeah. And, and, and one, well, even for younger guys in clomiphene, I've seen it get testosterone levels 900, no problem. And estrogen, not too, you know, too wonky. Definitely. So yeah, I know we're yeah. probably short on your time though, dude. <laughs> I really appreciate you jumping on. I'd love to catch up with you more here uh, again. Um, and, and fill everyone in where you're at if, they, if they're interested in getting uh, the, the tested and kind of your, so, you can plug social media and stuff in yeah. your company. Yeah, absolutely. If, if anyone, you feel free to search on Google True Diagnostic. That's T R U Diagnostic Singular. Um, and if you enter epigenetic age testing, you'll certain to find us. You can reach out to us, uh, you know, on the contact us on our website. If you want any more information, if you want samples of reports, uh, or if you even want to be connected to a physician uh, uh, in your area that has an expertise in this. And so, um, feel free to reach out to us, and hopefully, uh, we'll we'll talk whenever we go through your results next. Yeah, that'd be cool, man. That'd be real cool. Awesome. All right. Get you a test, but thanks so much again for the time. Appreciate having you, man. Take care, brother. Thanks so much.